In this episode of Flying Through Time, we focus on the Republic P-47, an American aircraft with a communist-sounding name. We also pay tribute to one of the world's greatest female aviators. And it's not Amelia Earhart. It's one of her best friends. Prior to World War II, many aviation competitions were held and often privately built planes outperformed military aircraft. We explore the connection of yesteryear's competitions and today's fastest motorsport, pylon racing. The Thunderbolt was the most famous of the Republic Aircraft Company's planes that they built during World War II. It was first flown on 6th of May 1941. The P-47 was designed as a large, high-performance fighter bomber. The power plant was the large Pratt & Whitney R-28 double wasp. At the time, many aircraft manufacturers were moving towards inline water-cooled engines, as supplied to the Mustang. But Republic decided to stay with the proven and tough radial engine. This would prove to be a wise decision, as the later Mustang with its inline engine and the P-47 with its radial engine ended up complementing each other. Like the Mustang, the first P-47s were Razorbacks, and pilot complaint was rear visibility. Pilots didn't know an enemy was tracking them until they were shot at. Again, like the Mustang, a bubble-type canopy was fitted to later models that gave pilots excellent visibility. The Pratt & Whitney R2800 turbo supercharged 18 cylinder air cooled radial engine created over 2000 horsepower and gave the P47 excellent performance with a large load carrying capability the first deliveries of the P47 took place in June 1942 and the US Army Air Corps began flying it in the European theater Although it was an excellent aeroplane, several improvements were made as production continued. Each improvement added power, maneuverability and range. As the war progressed, the Thunderbolt, or Jug as it was affectionately called, gained a reputation as a reliable and extremely tough aeroplane able to take incredible amounts of damage and still return its pilot home safely. The only vulnerable place on the P-47 was the position of the fuel tank. It was located right under the pilot's seat. If it was hit, the pilot had to be quick to get out. During the German raids, bomber losses were disastrous, so jugs were pressed into service and one of the roles was bomber support. Jugs could match anything the Luftwaffe had, and the idea of bomber escorts was good and did assist in lessening the bomber losses. But the Jug didn't have the range to escort the bombers on the round trip to Germany. At about this time, the Mustang was being used in ground attack missions, and the inline engine was very vulnerable in this line of combat. Even small caliber fire could damage the liquid cooling system. However, it was proved that the Mustang had incredibly low fuel consumption. With a 425 gallon fuel tank capacity and an engine that used about 50% less fuel than other fighters, 
the P-51B had a range of 1,080 miles. With drop tanks attached, this range increased to 2,600 miles. So the Mustang took over the role of bomber escorts, and for the first time, the Allies had planes capable of protecting bombers on long-range missions. The Mustang's ability to protect the bombers had a large effect on the efficiency of the raids. No longer could Luftwaffe fighters enjoy turkey shoots of Allied bombers. From this point on, the German fighter aircraft were on the defensive. This freed up more P-47s for ground attack and field support missions. The P-47 was twice as heavy as any other fighter before it. Most of the extra weight was due to the extensive armor plating incorporated into the body of the plane. Not only was the plane difficult to shoot down, it packed a lethal sting. It had 80 50 caliber Browning wing-mounted machine guns and could carry 2,500 pounds of externally mounted bombs, rockets, or other free-fall ordnance. Even though it was heavy, the P-47 had a maximum speed of 433 miles per hour, which made it the fastest fighter in service. It had a ceiling of 41,000 feet and was equally at home in high-altitude dogfights or low-level ground attack. Apart from its lack of range, it could be argued that this plane was the best all-round fighter of the war. The numbers are there to support this argument. Enemy vehicles destroyed, 160,000. Enemy aircraft destroyed, 11,874. Enemy trains destroyed, 9,000. It could be said that the P-47 Thunderbolt was a Russian-designed plane. The aircraft was the product of two Russian immigrants, Alexander Seversky and Alexander Kartveli, who had left their homeland to escape the Reds. Seversky was an extremely colorful character. He became a naval aviator in the Tsar's forces in World War I. He lost a leg early in the conflict, but returned to the air with an artificial leg and claimed 13 kills in combat. In 1918, after the October Revolution of 1917, Seversky was sent to the U.S. as part of a military mission. Having no confidence in the new regime, he decided to stay in America and became an aeronautic engineer. Seversky obtained American citizenship in 1927, and during 1931, he founded the Seversky Aircraft Company. The company was very small, with Seversky acting as president, designer, and chief test pilot. But he also hired a fellow Russian expatriate named Alexander Kartveli as a design engineer. He was an original designer with many innovative ideas, and eventually became chief designer when Seversky became preoccupied with the business aspects of running the company. Seversky gathered momentum for his company by participating in the Bendex series of aircraft races during the 1930s. It's interesting to note that in the early days of air shows, the biggest attractions were the air races, and builders of planes like Seversky continually outperformed the best military planes. Seversky had one of the most notable aviators in history to fly to, was the result of an attempt to reverse the trend towards ever-increasing weight and complexity in fighter aircraft.
When it first appeared in the mid-1950s, it had a futuristic look about it, and its small wing area and needle nose earned it the nickname of Missile with a Man in It. The F-104 was the first operational interceptor capable of sustained speeds above Mach 2 and was the first aircraft ever to hold the world speed and altitude records simultaneously. Although a successful plane and very revolutionary, many pilots had trouble with the F-104. Some dubbed it the Widowmaker due to the high rate of pilot fatalities. Major General Fred J. Ascani described the Starfighter as scary and fast. He went on to say, and I quote, if you want to get an idea of how dangerous that plane is, you should dig into the German Air Force accident records for the F-104 and count the fatalities. They attribute them to pilot error, but it wasn't the case. I think they lost something like 85 F-104s in the first one and a half years of flying them. 85? That's more than two killed a week during some weeks. They blamed it on the pilot, but the plane had a nasty tendency to pitch up under certain conditions, and there wasn't much you could do to save yourself under those conditions. It wasn't, and still isn't, a very forgiving aeroplane. It will not forgive a pilot the slightest error, and you get into fatally hot water so fast." Unquote. There are mixed feelings about the F-104, but Jackie Cochran used it to prove that a woman could fly any aeroplane equally as well as any man. During the war years, much competition flying was put on hold. However, with so many surplus warbirds available after the war, a sport known as pylon racing became very popular with both pilots and spectators. Today, there are many classes of racing, but it's still the warbirds of the Second World War that many people find most interesting, if not romantic. In this instance, two Sea Furies are competing against a Strike Master. It's possible that this is the first time propeller planes have faced off with a jet. It becomes apparent that the early jets did have a substantial speed advantage over the internal combustion engines. However, the Sea Furies are displaying an ability to hold a much tighter turn than the jet. Pylon racing involves planes racing around a series of pylons which are placed in the ground. The rules are very simple first plane to complete a given number of laps is the winner. This sport is very popular in the USA and it's possible that this particular event which was held in the Australian state of Tasmania was the first ever pylon racing event held outside the United States. The sport is the fastest motorsport in the world and just like any other motorsport engine breakdowns occur. Unlike a car which simply rolls to a stop after a breakdown planes lose altitude, which places the pilot in a life-threatening situation. This plane has just suffered a malfunction and pulls out of the race. After the race, the pilot admitted he would not have been able to keep the plane in the air for more than a further 10 seconds. Notice the front wheel wobble when the plane lands. It's the engine vibration that's causing this wobble. 
It was a close call like this one that made Saversky consider giving up competition flying. Also, the US military disapproved as they were not keen to lose Saversky's talent to a crash. Apart from the European theater, Saversky's P-47s were put into service in the Pacific. There, they flew ground attack and support missions. The Battle of the Marianas was one of their most celebrated missions. In late May 1944, P-47s of the 318th Fighter Group were being prepared for battle. From Pearl Harbor, they were loaded onto carriers and stored for their sea journey to the Marianas. P-47s would not be flown in the initial air combat. As they were not carrier craft, they would not be able to make a carrier landing. They would make only one carrier takeoff. At the same time, the sea fleet that would lead the assault was also ready. An engineering group was dispatched as well. If the invasion was successful, the engineers would be needed to repair the Japanese runways for use by the P-47s. The invasion of the Marianas was a major step forward for the Allies, and if successful, the Allies could complete the blockade of Japan, cutting off their war supplies, including the much-needed rubber and oil. In fact, the Battle of the Marianas would be Japan's defeat. They simply wouldn't be able to operate without the control of this tiny group of islands. The three important islands were Saipan, Tinian, and Guam as they had airfields. The Allies needed to capture at least one of these and then begin the operation of the P-47s to attain air superiority over the region. The first to fall was Saipan's Aslito airfield and the engineers immediately started repairing the runway. Littering the airfield were the wrecks of Japanese planes. A total loss of 420 planes was inflicted on the Japanese in this battle, and it was a loss from which they would not recover. When the runway was repaired, the P-47s were flown in from the carriers to the strip. They left at a rate of one every two minutes, and none was lost. The new strip was renamed Bisley, and this would be the new home for the 318th fighter group. The Japanese, although evicted from the airfield, still put up a tremendous fight to prevent the Allies from using it. No sooner had the first P-47s landed, they were armed and sent straight into battle. By nightfall, they'd already carried out several missions. The Thunderbolts were an important part of winning the Saipan, Tinian and Guam campaigns. On Saipan alone, over 26,000 Japanese lives were lost. The Battle of the Marianas was the last time the Japanese could engage any real sea defense or attack and their air force was becoming very depleted of both planes and pilots. The production run of the P-47 ended in December 1945, and over 15,500 were built which makes it one of the most prolifically produced fighter aircraft in history. Technology was growing rapidly, and the day of the propeller fighter was ending just as fast.
However, the U.S. Air Force retained some P-47s until 1949, and the U.S. Air National Guard maintained a small number until 1953. Others were paid out to many Latin American air forces that operated them through the 1950s. Like all the famous World War II fighters, by the time the war ended, they had had their day as the jet age was emerging. That concludes another episode of Flying Through Time. Be sure to join us again when we continue to unravel the fascinating stories of the planes that stand out in our short history of flight.